Ladies and gentlemen, we are back. We are certainly back and the panel will take place. We will be talking now about the future of communities, future that is decided by voting. That's, after all, the purpose of elections. Interestingly, disinformation is a word that we almost automatically associate now with elections. It has cropped up in the previous presentation by Bob in the context of destabilizing them. Disinformation is not only out there, it's gaining on sophistication and it is organized into carefully orchestrated campaigns, often using the available technical potential to draw on nothing else but our fears. Now, how to defend elections against such hostile interference will be the subject tackled for us today by Jakub Turowski, Head of Public Policy for Poland, Baltics, Romania and Bulgaria at Facebook, David Carroll, Associate Professor of Media Design at Parsons School for Design, Mariette Scharke, International Policy Director of the Cyber Policy Center at Stanford University and President of Cyber Peace Institute, in a discussion moderated instead of Matthew Rosenberg, who faced technical difficulties, but by Michał Rakowski, Director for Strategic Partnerships and Projects of the Kościuszko Institute. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, to CyberSec. Uh, unfortunately, Ro Mr. Rosenberg couldn't be able to connect, so I hope to do my best to replicate his questions and do as well as him in continuing this discussion with you. So, in the previous years, starting from 2016, we could have observed how electoral processes in democratic countries are subject to adversarial actions by malign foreign powers. With that process, we could see how the very digital tools that we use on a daily basis for our lives, businesses, and social interactions are being weaponized by malicious foreign actors to destabilize the electoral processes around the world. So I would like to invite you to a conversation that will touch on and address, first and foremost, how do we assess those developments from the perspective of the 2020? What can we learn from what we have observed in the past? And what are the best solutions that we can implement to make sure that the democratic processes will be secure and safe in the years to come? And I would like to start with the question for David. David, in 2018, you have filed a claim to Cambridge Analytica for your data. Um, some might see you as a, and this act as an act of civic courage and might perceive you as an individual that is taking on this nexus of capitalism surveillance in order to fight for privacy. So from the perspective of late 2020, could you tell us what did you learn during this, those two years? What are your reflections on this whole process of securing privacy on digital platforms? And what major challenges are still with us and still need addressing when it comes to safety of electoral processes? Thank you, Mikhail, for um, being on this panel with us and taking over for Matthew at the last minute. We appreciate that. And thank you for the question and the opportunity to um, sort of re reflect on this past four years has been um, an yeah. exercise in using the rights and tools that are available to residents of the EU and the UK that are not available to citizens of the US and other countries that are not data protecting states. So because uh, the EU Charter pr provisions for data protection as a fundamental human right. Uh, citizens and voters in those countries have a right to their own d d data and they have a right to demand it. They have a right to explanations about it. They have a right to have a regulator protect them from when companies and organizations refuse to comply. And the one thing that we achieved in contesting the Cambridge Analytica and SCL companies was that uh, the British re regulator, the ICO, was able to get a cr criminal conviction for ignoring the order 
to fully disclose my da data set. And, but we did not achieve uh, the answers to our simple questions, which were, where did they get our data? What did they do with it? How did they process it? How did it you know, potentially destabilize our sense of confidence in our electoral pr process through the abuse of data at mass scale? And one of the things that I'm very worried about in 2020 is that I am quite confident that, that a vendor will not make the mistake that SCL made in 2016 and export U.S. voter data to a data protecting state, but rather will keep our voter data in the United States and therefore shield it from any accountability. We do not have tools in the U.S. to gain the visibility that we were, we were by a loophole of transnational regulatory arbitrage to see into what happened in 2016. So I would say that we have less visibility than 2016, and I am concerned that it will propose challenges to detect more mass data abuse. The challenge then for the United States is can we catch up with the European Union and the UK and other states and grant voters a fundamental right of access to their own data so that we have some ability to monitor and regulate the use of data in elections and to deter mass data abuse, which I believe continues to be perpetrated at scale both by domestic and foreign actors against U.S. voters. Thank you, David. Uh, Mariette, you have worked in the European Parliament on the very challenges that we are discussing today, and now you are active in academia in the United States. So from both your perspectives as a lawmaker in Europe and as an academic in the U.S., where would you say lies the responsibility for putting regulation in place to safeguard those electoral processes and who should be the main actors responsible to making those democracies safe? Thank you so much. And uh, I fully agree with what David said about the importance of laws. And clearly, democratically elected lawmakers are the most legitimate to make sure that the democratic rights of the people they represent are protected. And clearly, those rights are under pressure by those who seek to manipulate or hack or otherwise um, change the outcomes of the elections or, you know, abuse uh, vulnerabilities that might exist. And so I think that beyond the laws that should safeguard people's rights, there should also be very practical stress testing, for example, of the electoral infrastructure. And oftentimes that infrastructure is very decentralized. And so there may well be big differences between what the state of cybersecurity is of one part of the electoral system uh, in one state versus the other state. And so I think it's important to get one set of standards when it comes to cybersecurity criteria uh, and that it's uh, regularly stress tested and that um, authorities on the local level can rely on much more uh, expert level knowledge compared to what they themselves might be able to uh, muster together or uh, obtain commercially because a lot of these authorities are working with volunteers with low budgets and that's a challenge. And similarly, political parties and candidates need to play their role. Uh, it is now very tempting to use all the possibilities that may be available through consultants that are promising the world to these candidates and that may actually use the kinds of information that is hacked or leaked or uh, otherwise uh, might use botnets or whatnot to amplify a message, participating exactly in those kinds of practices that have eroded the trust in the electoral process. And so beyond the harder cybersecurity measures, I think the, the area of disinformation is extremely urgent, uh, especially now that, for example, the US presidential election uh, is taking place in an unusual condition of a global pandemic, where uh, the voting might not be as easy physically as it usually is. And so having voters educated about what they can expect by trusted messengers is a very important antidote to disinformation and misinformation. And I think 
One important lesson from 2016 as well is that it's so vital that there is independent oversight and scrutiny and that the problem is looked in the eye. Because what we see now is that, you know, the focus on foreign interference has obscured the vision uh, over how much domestic interference is already taking place. And so I think it's important to have an open, independent, 360 degrees view of the kinds of risks that may be um, waged against the electoral process, the fundaments of a democracy. And so it is essential that resources are made available, that laws are up to date, and that practical steps, for example, stress testing electoral systems or making sure that there are high level trustworthy messengers that can educate voters, journalists, and others uh, are, are in place. Thank you, Mariette. Jacob, you represent the company that is the most critical one, the most critical digital platform when it comes to the electoral processes and political campaigning. And in your role that covers several of European states you probably deal on a daily basis with issues related to misinformation and disinformation. And as David and Mariette has mentioned, legal regulations, education and democratic oversight, from the perspective of Facebook, what are the key tools that should be in place so also digital platforms can contribute to this fight with election interference? Right. Um... Thank you very much, Michal, for, for having me. Um, thank you very much for moderating this, this panel. Um, well, first of all, I really want to emphasize that protecting the integrity of the elections while preserving freedom of expression is really a top priority for us, for Facebook. And obviously, we're really not the same company versus um, 2016. And using lessons learned from the past, and input from experts and policymakers across you know, all political spectrum. We've made really substantial investments in teams and technologies to better secure the elections. We now have more than 35,000 people around the world working on safety and security, and their job is to monitor for suspicious activity, quickly identify content and behavior that violates our policies, remove it, and prevent it from being used again. Now, our strategy to protect the elections not only applies during critical times, like one or two months during the, uh, before the elections, it's really a kind of a year-long process, and it's centered around three main areas. The first one is preventing interference, the second one is all that is kind of content related. When, what I mean by that is really removing harmful content and reducing misinformation. And the third one, which I believe is also key, is increasing transparency and in particular ads transparency. So with, with reference to what I call, what we call preventing interference, a key part of our strategy is indeed to prevent interference um, and we do it by working with government authorities, law enforcement, security experts, civil society, and other tech companies to stop emerging threats by establishing a direct line of communication, by sharing knowledge and identifying opportunities of collaboration. And from this perspective, what Bob Kolaski said in the former intervention was also super important, that this kind of partnership approach is really a key to, to success in this very complex battle. We have advanced our security operations uh, to take down manipulation campaigns and identify emerging threats. Um, our teams of investigators actively look for and take down coordinated network of inauthentic accounts, pages, groups, um, and we seek to uh, really try all these kind of ways to manipulate public debates. And again, we have removed thousands of pages, groups, and accounts involved in coordinated inauthentic behavior, only 50 networks in 19, and we've blocked millions of fake accounts a day so that they cannot spread misinformation. 
So from this kind of, again, interference prevention perspective, um, there's really a lot to be done. And there's really a lot that is being done. Now, there's another aspect that is really super important, is all that is content related. And here we apply a kind of three-party strategy. We say we remove some sort of content, we reduce the spread of other content, and we inform our, uh, our users. When I say remove, we indeed remove a lot of content. We remove content that violates our community standards, including fake accounts and accounts engaged in inauthentic behavior, misinformation that may contribute to the risk of imminent violence or harm, voter fraud or interference, hate speech, bullying, and harassment. And we also remove ads that violate our advertising policies, but I'll come back to that later when talking about transparency and transparency of political ads. There's a lot of content for which we do reduce uh, the, the reach on, on our platform. There's a lot of problematic content that does not meet the standards for removal on the, our community standards, but still undermines the authenticity of the platform, such as clickbaits or content that's been checked as fake by our third party fact checkers. And these kind of content, we, um, as soon as we are informed by our fact, uh, third party fact checkers, we reduce by up to 80% the reach of, these, of this kind of content on, on our platform. And finally, and here, I, 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 when I'm in such conferences, I often say that we may have the best tools ever is if there's no more kind of raising awareness of the population about how important it is to be careful about what content people read and what content people have in front of them on the internet, this battle won't be won. And this is why the information aspect is absolutely crucial. Um, for content across Facebook and Instagram that's been rated false uh, or partially false by our fact checkers, for instance, uh, we label it as false, but we also add additional articles really explaining what is the issue of it. That is one aspect. Another aspect is that we, ahead of elections, launch massive media literacy campaigns in all the countries where we operate, in all the countries where we have elections, so that really there is, again, among our users, um, the, the sentiment of, um, of the importance of, um, of being wise in reading content online. So again, this all is a, an extremely complex puzzle. There's a lot of pieces in it, um, but we really try to take our part in, in protecting the elections everywhere. There's of course all the regulatory aspects, uh, but I understand we will tackle that uh, further on. Thank you, Jacob. David, with the US elections just one month away, and you are a frequent commenter on that topic in social media. What is the biggest fear that you have concerning your previous activities and concerning what you see is at stake right now? Has the stakes evolved in any way since 2016? And if so, in what way? Thank you. Um, yes, to extend uh, my opening comment, the conditions of 2016 and 2018 continue into 2020 with regards to our inability to achieve accountability with the abuse of voter data in various ways through official and unofficial ways. And in particular, I'm very concerned about voter suppression and voter deterrent campaigns in which individual voters are targeted using their personal day data to disengage from the voting pr process. I'm not confident that there has been enough pr progress in achieving the visibility into this so that it can be counteracted. Um, and related to that, um, the way that personal data can sort of have the uh, inverse effect where it can animate voters to engage in the civic process over inflammatory issues, over divisive issues, over issues that are driven by the emotion of fear 
rather than in the you know instinct to participate in civic government and the notion of self governance and consent of the governed. So I think we have a lot of work to do to better understand how individual voters are targeted, how the sort of feedback loop of our unregulated ad tech industry is interspersed with the voter analytics in industry and then interconnected and enabled by the advertising industry related to you know one-to-one -one voter targeting. I don't think that the average US voter has any sense of what their consumer and political profile looks like because we can't see them. And unfortunately, candidates, campaigns, vendors, and donors have all the privacy because they can protect this from view and voters have none. They cannot see this uh, hidden world and they cannot understand how they may be singled out and selected as a calculated battleground voter, and they may be um, being misled or inflamed or abused in various ways without their knowledge, without their consent, and without any associated rights. And I think what's important to for um, p m members of the audience in uh, European Union member states and other data protecting states is the conduct of the data analytics industry is generally unlawful in your countries. And this disparity between practices in the United States versus other versus the European Union, for, for example, is something that I also think is not very well appreciated. And I would hope that voters in the European Union exercise their data rights to ensure that the same conditions aren't emerging in European states, which have greater abilities to um, expose this, to critique it, uh, to activate regulators to pre prevent it, and to better understand how um, without these kinds of protections, our democracies move closer and closer towards what I would call an algorithmic democracy. That is, machines and algorithms are increasingly deciding which voters matter and which voters don't and which voters will decide the election and which will be suppressed and deterred from participating. And until we can create accountability to these technologies and tools, uh, it does threaten our basic confidence that every vote is counted, every vote is equal, and every voter has been enabled to participate and, and is not secretly subject to an influence campaign. And finally, I'll say that the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence released its final report, volume five of its Russia investigation, and there was a whole section Influence for Hire, which listed out various vendors and companies that pitched the campaign to conduct influence campaigns that co companies like Facebook would otherwise recognize as campaigns that need to be removed from the platform. And I don't see a discussion now about how official vendors of a political campaign will be regulated in the same way that hostile or foreign or unofficial um, members will be using similar tactics that the boundary and fine line between this is as blurry as can be and is related only to who's paying the bills for these efforts. And to know that political campaigns are being pitched these, uh, as it was clearly stated in the Senate Intelligence Committee report, um, it's another example of so much more work we have to do to lift the veil over this secrecy and even a slight recalibration of the privacy asymmetry that is giving voters more visibility into the system and giving advertisers and campaigns more ma mandates to disclose their activities and prevent their ability to shield their identities, I think could have very positive disproportionate effects 
on this problem and in this system. But again, m many moving pieces to get together and still so much that we're learning about 2016. And the last thing I'll say is the election moves faster than our ability to understand and solve and regulate these problems. So we are moving into the next election and the whole story of Cambridge Analytica, for example, is still not been told. Thank you, David. Uh, Marietje, David began on creating this image of a voter who is to a point unconscious of how his data and how his vote and how his position in the electoral process has been taken advantage of by malicious actors or actors that want to capitalize on it. So do you think that voters in Europe are in a similar position to that average or this figure of a US voter that David has just painted to us? Do European voters are better equipped either by education or by the legal framework that we have in place since the GDPR and the laws that we are discussing right now on the forum of the EU? Or is it more like, despite the, the legal framework that is being created to actually empower the individual when it comes to his data privacy, he still remains to be unconscious to a certain point of all this very complex interplay of power and capitalism that is beyond the, the political campaigns on social media, etc. Well, let me try to sketch this very clearly. It is very popular for Europeans to market, sell, and celebrate the general data protection regulation. And I agree it was a step in the right direction, but it did not in any way curb the outsized power of big tech companies. And I think that that privatized governance over the information architecture, the information flows, the public debate, uh, and their ability to uh, foster, intendedly or unintendedly, uh, disinformation, allowing it to go viral, uh, the micro-targeting model that is so crucial to advertising platforms like Facebook. I think that outsized role has not been addressed properly anywhere, not in Europe, not in the United States. And this is a huge problem. Uh, I think that democratic lawmakers, to some extent, have abdicated their responsibility to really put democratic principles first and to say that there's also a public interest that needs to be defended. If you look at the way in which media laws have shaped over decades, there has been very deliberate thinking about how to, through regulations, safeguard freedom of expression, but also pluralistic debate, for example. And if you juxtapose a pluralistic public debate with the way in which social media platforms work, which is basically the more you pay, the more views you get, uh, it is a, a big contrast, and the whole commercial model does not serve democracy. It has not been built to foster democracy, despite the words that we might hear about freedom of expression and community building. When we boil it down to the bottom line, these are advertising companies that are seeking to maximize revenues. That's what they're made for. And we can only assess whether measures taken by technology companies are sufficient when they can be tested independently. And so whether it is for parliamentarians to have a better view of what is actually at stake, we need more access to information, more transparency to allow for accountability and evidence-based lawmaking, or whether it's the new world that I work in uh, at Stanford at a university, independent researchers need to have much more access to information to understand better in the public interest what happens under the hood of these big technology platforms. And so I think that the, the main disbalance that needs to be corrected is that between private company power over the democratic process without any accountability or without uh, much transparency into what is happening so that if there is a gap between the laws as they exist and uh, the practices as they emerge can be, can be closed on the basis of evidence. I mean, it's ironic to say the least, the amount of times that I've had discussions with corporate officials who say, ugh, you know, democratic lawmakers don't understand anything about how the platforms really work. They keep proposing these completely, you know, misguided uh, legal, legal proposals 
um, it is it is really problematic. And then you have to ask yourself, well, what kind of access to information were these lawmakers given? You know, and this asymmetry between governance by private companies and governance by democratically elected officials needs to tilt back in favor of democracy. And that is a, a problem that goes far beyond impacting elections, but where, of course, the electoral process is one of the most telling examples of where people's rights are at stake, but it's not the only area where this is a problem. Thank you, Marietje. Jacob, so let's move to the regulations. And I understand that Facebook is very eager to cooperate with governments and lawmakers when it comes to regulations that help to ensure the electoral processes are, aren't interrupted. But what, what is your opinion and what is your assessment on that cooperation with public sector, with lawmakers? Do you feel that Facebook is providing them with enough level of openness? And do you receive as a company enough of feedback and enough of support that you need to, to be able to implement regulations that are being put in place? Yeah, thank you very much for this question, Michal. Um, before I answer that, though, uh, I'd like to come back to the transparency um, aspect that's been tackled uh, by, um, by, by David. Um, so I, I guess I fully agree that in the digital world, transparency is still a journey, but I think we are definitely on it. Um, and today, um, things are maybe not perfect, but Facebook provides an industry-leading level of transparency around political advertising and pages so that people, people can really see uh, who is trying to influence them. This includes, for instance, uh, the fact that to run a political or social issue ad, advertisers must go through an authorization process, which includes providing who they are and where they are, so that we are sure that ads are not targeted from foreign countries. Then, of course, we have the uh, political and issue ads um, that we, I mean, a body that wants to make political or issue ads has to say who's paying for the ad. And this is, I mean, something that does not exist in other media. And this is, again, we can improve things, but this is really something um, in terms of transparency and for the people to understand where the ad comes from that is totally new and I believe um, quite, quite strong. Um, so there is a lot of things like that, that indeed uh, go towards more transparency, because indeed we do believe that transparency with regards to political ads, to issue ads, is super important. That being said, coming back to the question about regulations, it's been many years that we call in some specific uh, topics, including all that is related with um, political ads and elections integrity for more regulations. Is it the best case scenario that uh, a private company has to choose on its own what is, for instance, a, a, a social ad? What is to be called a, a social issue? Of course not. And we would be more than happy um, to have more guidelines in the different countries where we operate. Now, in Europe, we have the European Democracy Action Plan that is now being discussed. And first of all, it is really important to say that Facebook welcomes the EDA proposal. Um, broadly speaking, I mean, the cooperation between governments, industry, media, civil society, academia is absolutely essential. Um, Facebook has steadily increased its investment in tools, technology and infrastructure to enforce our policies and promote authentic communications via our services. Now, in the debate about elections and misinformation, the reality is that even though the debate is quite old already, there is much confusion, much confusion between concepts such as misinformation, disinformation, foreign interference, influence, information operations, or even elections integrity. And as policymakers decide on the appropriate measures to tackle disinformation, um, it is important that definitions used are really clear and precise to ensure rules and regulations, as well as then the enforcement measures, are fit to propose. Now, from our point of view, potential regulation should be focused, for instance, on first rules to address political advertising, 
that includes greater transparency uh, for, indeed, contribution, <laughs> ad spending, and clarity and definition. What is a political ad? Today, we are kind of the one who has to define by ourselves what is a political ad. Again, it's not the best position, and we really don't want to be in this position. And it also includes common EU regulatory frameworks for election, um, and in particular, like, for instance, cross-border political advertising and campaign financing. This is an issue that we had, for instance, last year during the EU election. What is considered foreign in the EU context? Now, our approach to misinformation is guided by the principle that we should provide people with accurate and informative content while also balancing, of course, freedom of expression. Our users want to have high quality content on the platform. Fine, so do we. However, defining what constitutes misinformation is very challenging. And adding to the challenge is determining who decides of something, if something is true or not, who or what is the source of truth, and what should the penalties be. And here, any regulation attempting to address these questions well, risks some restrictions on legitimate speech and will be anyway questions. And when we talk about regulation and when we talk about EDAF, there are two uh, kind of maybe additional things that I believe are really crucial. Of course, all the tools, transparency, cooperation is of massive importance. But again, I really want to come back also to the, uh, all the media literacy aspects um, and to the um, aspect related to journalism. Uh, I mean, boosting journalism and helping news organizations adapt to the changing digital world is something that is also important so that we all, as citizens, are sure that we have access to high-quality information, high-quality journalism. Thank you, Jacob. Before we move to the questions from the audience, I have one last question I would like to ask one, each one of you. So, David, obviously working as a teacher, you, have to, you are in contact with a lot of youth. You probably talk with them about how they find themselves in, on social media in the context of election interference and disinformation and manipulation of information. So would you say that these actions that were mentioned in this discussion that are centered on education, on raising awareness of all of the uh, framework or the economic framework that is behind how we use social media and how our data is being used on social media is probably or maybe the best solution we might have to actually gain resilience not even on a state level or societal level, but on an individual level to those manipulations that we are more and more often a target of. Thank you. Um, so indeed, uh, my teaching has sought to explore these issues uh, with students and to help them synthesize their own views and potential so solutions. Um, and I'm always heartened to watch young people grasp the big issue and especially coming from a digital native perspective that sometimes those of us who uh, sort of grew up during the advent of the internet uh, you know, may not immediately grasp. And I think that the, um, the various uh, documentaries that have been made recently, of course, the one that uh, I was in, uh, in the Netflix, but um, others and more to come still um, have a very positive effect on um, communicating to a mass audience really complicated issues that we would be dealing with in a highly specialized conference like this and are distilled for the mass audience on streaming platforms and on television and so on. And I think this is very important in raising the general awareness and creating the resiliency. And I'm uh, very heartened by the response to films like The Great Hack on Netflix and from an, an incredibly international aud audience, uh, the, the people that have reached out to me from every continent uh, because of the global reach of a, of a media enterprise like 
Netflix. I mean, few other companies can release a film in every language in one moment. Uh, the film was uh, not available in China, Syria, North Korea, and Crimea, and, but was available everywhere else in the world and translated and localized into every language. So the global conversation about these issues, these particular issues about data abuse, disinformation, election manipulation, the sort of underground dark business models that lurk beneath this, um, it's a fascinating story to those of us in these spheres and has recently within the past couple of years become a fascination of the ordinary person. And this is good news that filmmakers and media makers have been able to sort of translate us and decipher us into common language and compelling narratives. And we need more of this. And I think this is a key role of storytellers to break down these issues so that ordinary people can understand them and then consider them as they in, you know, engage in their digital lives and try to be uh, civic actors in their communities. Um, and there's a great appreciation for these films and there are more to come. So it's almost becoming a genre onto itself. Thank you, David. Mariette, uh, the discussion has mentioned the Euro European Democratic Action Plan that is supposed to put rules or define rules for how digital platforms are to govern the issue of election interference, how to deal with it. Do you feel that this legislation is going to make a significant impact and actually make electoral processes more secure and more transparent in the long run? Well, the, the idea that tech platforms are held to account and are um, held to certain criteria is, of course, long overdue. So, yes, I think that it's a step in the right direction, but there's a, a wide spectrum of areas that um, range from political ads to political party financing to cybersecurity to uh, platform governance that all need to be tackled in order to uh, get to a better place. And then the question always is enforcement. And so if you look at one of the lessons learned from the general data protection regulation is that even the people who actually think it is a good law, and I think it is... Um, you know, there's a lot of room for improvement in the law itself, but even those who think that the law is perfect agree that the enforcement has really been lacking. And that's because there is a lack of knowledge, a lack of capacity in terms of resources, uh, in terms of staff. And when you look at a company like Facebook, which has uh, billions and billions in revenues, armies of lawyers who can challenge every and any decision uh, made that impact, impacts it negatively with you know, top-notch lawyers, then you have to ask yourself, you know, what kind of capacity do you need uh, on the other on the other end of that in the public interest to make sure that this is actually going to be enforceable? And so I would say that beyond the parameters of the uh, proposal itself, it's, it's very important to think about how the scrutiny is going to uh, be enforced, with what mandate can a regulator, for example, or a, a watchdog demand information from the companies, uh, information that is currently very proactively shielded, uh, hidden behind trade secrets, other intellectual property law, very much invisible uh, to, to people outside of the companies. And so this notion of an actual independent set of eyes looking at what is happening and what that means for access to information to actually not trust but verify, uh, I think is another important component to make sure that this is in practice going to make a difference and not just on paper. Thank you. And Jacob, how would you respond to that, to that idea of establishing a permanent set of oversight mechanisms that look on how companies actually deal with data where do they store them? How do they manipulate with them? Or how do they process them? I obviously don't have a, a, a kind of defined answer to, 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 to this question. What is clear, however, is that on this elections related file, uh, like on many, many others, uh, we indeed, as I already said, uh, call for a greater presence of regulators, uh, call for more um, a kind of sustainable approach uh, in the regulations that, uh, that we face, 
Um, and again, something that is really enforceable, uh, something on which the industry, policymakers, regulator, the civic society will agree on, and something that then uh, we as big tech companies will be really able to deliver, and then people will be able to check that we deliver that. Um, now, again, I cannot answer your question specifically, um, but solutions uh, that will go towards um, protecting democracy in a way that all the digital stakeholders are kind of in an agreement of where we want to go is definitely uh, something we should work on. Thank you. And we have the questions from the audience. Uh, the first one comes from Alexi Drew, who asks on how much cooperation exists between platforms with regards to countering platform manipulation and disinformation. How effective has this been and how do you envisage the cooperative approach developing in the future? And I believe, Jacob, that this question is to you. Yeah, so with all that is related to both misinformation, uh, but also really tracking uh, and taking down um, inauthentic behavior, coordinated inauthentic behavior on our platform, um, cooperation is maybe the key word. And obviously the cooperation is between different tech companies. We definitely, when needed, exchange information uh, to track the bad guys, so to say, uh, but it's also with uh, governmental institutions, with public administration, uh, with academia, um, because there are some things we do see on the platform, some other stuff we don't, we just don't, it's out, outside the platform. And other stakeholders that are also active in the cybersec world have a broader view, have a maybe more helicopter view than we do, and then can help us to indeed find things um, that should be found. So cooperation do ex does exist, and it's really an essential, an essential sorry, point. Thank you. And we have a second question from Oksana Manchulenko, who asks if standard methods against hostile interference are not working, or even officials are reluctant to adopt them, how to tackle this interference and not become the one you are defending against? And this question I would like to ask to Maria Tishak. Thank you. I think preserving the freedoms and the rights of people um, is of vital importance. And it also means that not going overboard in, for example, restricting legitimate speech or legitimate communications or legitimate actions is very important. But I think at this moment in time, we are out of balance in the public interest, uh, democratic lawmakers vis-a-vis -vis, uh, corporate officials in even grasping what the real flows of information, attempts at disinformation really look like. And um, in that sense, I do believe that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to correct that balance and to make sure that um, people's rights can practically be better protected in an ever-changing landscape of the way in which social media companies work. Because make no mistake, the machine learning processes, the algorithmic tweaks change all the time. So my experience on a, a given platform or a search engine or whatnot may be different today than it was yesterday. Uh, and your experience can be different from mine. So the point is that it's, it's almost impossible to get an overview of what people actually are experiencing. And that I think is a problem because the, the kind of agency that is needed to apply checks and balances to these big corporations uh, almost doesn't exist anymore. And so I very much want to push back against the notion of co cooperation that we heard Jacob saying is, is Facebook's preferred approach. I understand because then the company retains the most agency. But I don't think uh, a butcher should test its own meat or to use another metaphor that a referee um, uh, can be a player on the team as well. There has to be independent oversight, independent checks and verifications, not so much cooperation. In what other sector does uh, oversight come from cooperation? Instead, it comes from rigorous independence. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that is the best medicine for the outsized power of tech companies right now. Thank you, thank you, Mariette. And also the same question goes to David. David, if standard methods of fight against interference do not work, how do we tackle this interference and not become the one we are defending against? 
Thank you. Um, yes, I, I will uh, extend the frustration that from my personal perspective and my personal experience at you know, simply trying to exert some accountability on an abusive system, I, you know, was lucky enough to be able to pursue this challenge and I was ultimately unsuccessful. Ultimately, the UK Information Commissioner's Office did not succeed in its mandate to enforce the UK Data Protection Act. And they seized servers under criminal warrant and we don't know the results of that forensic investigation to this day. And I am frustrated with the fact that the Federal Trade Commission did not get to the bottom of the Cambridge Analytica scandal and did not depose Mark Zuckerberg as a condition of that settlement. And so, so much is left un resolved still. And the Senate Committee Intelligence Report concludes that it is unable to come to a conclusion about the Cambridge Analytica scandal because it did not have the cooperation of key witnesses. Witnesses uh, contradicted each other and did not have the cooperation of the UK authorities. So there wasn't even adequate cooperation between the US and the UK. So there's not even adequate cooperation amongst the regulators who are trying to address even historic level scandals. Uh, and then, <sighs> and then, you know, to think about how slowly it moves and how regular the election cycle is. Um, so it's quite frustrating to not succeed when <laughs> the, so much is at stake and so much is invested uh, we still haven't heard from the Irish D Data Protection Commissioner on all these outstanding issues. Um, the data cops are not adequately equipped to fight data crime. And that really tr troubles me. And we have tons of work to do on that front so that we can achieve um, a adequate level of supervision and oversight over the practices of tech companies and the practices of campaigns and the practices of advertisers to root them out from illegitimate activity and harmful activity and abusive activity. Thank you, David. So we will end on this slightly pessimistic note, but fortunately the tools and solutions are out, out there and we just need to go and grab them. And the process is not over yet. So thank you for this conversation during CyberSec Global 2020 on elections integrity. And I invite all of you to be witness to the further developments that will happen on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very thank much you. for attracting our attention to those important points, even though they may not be as optimistic as we probably hoped. But we see that perhaps the most important here is that our decisions may not necessarily be ours anymore. And the word cooperation that has returned is so important to make this subject a bit less tough for us.